Murder, Inc. was one of the most powerful labels in the game back in the 2000s. But after internal drama, bad management, and allegedly cleaning money for a brutal drug lord, it all fell apart, and this is the wild story of how it all went down. Before Earth Gotti linked up with his brother to form Murder, Inc., he got started in the industry as a DJ and called himself DJ Earth. The first time he had any success was when he linked up with a rapper named Mick Geronimo. They met each other at a talent show and Gotti ended up producing his first hit track, Shit's Real. Gotti came up in the streets of Queens and always loved the rap game. He was inspired by dudes like Dr. Dre, Easy e Russell Simmons, and from the jump, he was great at putting artists together to make the best track possible. And while he was putting Geronimo's first album together, Gotti got Jay-Z, DMX, and Ja Rule all on the song Time to Build. Lear Cohen from Def Jam Records recognized Gotti's talent immediately and signed him on as an A&R to find new artists for the label. Gotti was new to the game but already had plans to take over. When he met with Lior, he told him, I'm gonna become you and I'll destroy you. I'm from the hood. You can't know more about hip hop than me. Def Jam wasn't doing too hot back then and Lior was in danger of losing it completely. Gotti came in and wanted to sign DMX immediately. But when Lior said no because he thought DMX was too street, Gotti quit on the spot. Lior and Def Jam were down bad. So a few days later, he met with Gotti, and Gotti told him he can either sign DMX or he was gonna walk away for good. Lior agreed right then, and what came next shocked everyone. Gotti knew how dope X was, but his debut album came out at number one on the Billboard 200 chart, and when he dropped his second project a few months later, DMX became the first rapper to have his first two albums debut at number one in the same year. Bringing in DMX is what saved Def Jam and helped turn him into one of the most powerful labels in the rap game. Since Gotti's the one who made it happen, Russell Simmons gave him his own imprint under the label. One day, Gotti was watching a documentary about old school gangsters on TV when he saw the name Murder Inc. Murder Inc. was a group of professional hitmen that took money from all the mob bosses in New York and killed anyone they wanted. Nobody knows exactly how many bags they collected off people's heads, but the cops say it's at least 400 and might even be over a thousand. Gotti chose to name his label Murder Inc. because they put out hits for hire and Gotti wanted his artists to put out hit records. The first artists he signed were Ja Rule, Black Child, Ta Murda, and Nemesis. And the label was a success from the jump. Gotti co-produced Ja's first album, Veni Vedi Vici, which dropped in 99 and sold over 180k in the first week. The same month the album came out, Ja Rule, Jay-Z, and DMX were all featured on the cover of XXL magazine. Gotti wanted to put them all in a crew called Murder Inc., which could have been the best rap collective of all time. They recorded a few tracks together, and Gotti said that they were all trying to just kill each other in the booth and brought their hardest bars for every song. Unfortunately, all three of them were just too big to fit into a group. They all had successful solo careers at the same time, and the crew split up without ever dropping a project. Last year, Gotti and Ja went on Drink Champs, and Gotti revealed that Jay was the one who didn't really want to do it. Gotti tried two different times to get all three of them on an album together, but for some reason, Jay wasn't rocking with the idea. Jay says it wasn't just his fault that the crew never happened. He said that all three of them had their own egos and ambition, and that it was just three guys, three independent labels, three black men who were all fighting to be the best in the world. The Murder Inc. crew didn't work out, but that didn't slow Gotti and the label down at all. In 2000, they dropped Jaws' second album and debuted at number one on the Billboard 200. The record eventually went triple platinum and was a massive success for the label, and it also showed that they were trying to expand the sound and do more than just hardcore rap. Gotti had signed Vita, and her style helped them develop more radio-friendly tracks for the album. Black Child and Top Murder were featured too, and fans were waiting for them to drop their own solo records. Murder Inc. scored another big win the next year when they produced the official soundtrack for The Fast and the Furious. Gotti signed Ashanti the same year, and she helped Jaws' next album blow up even more. They linked up for the track Always On Time and hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, and Jaws' album Pain Is Love ended up going triple platinum. Ja had been the only star on Murder Inc but Ashanti came out of nowhere and started smashing the charts. Her track with Fat Joe, What's Love, came out at the same time as Always On Time, and she became the first female artist to ever have the top two spots on the Billboard Hot 100 at the same time. Then she dropped her debut single, Foolish, and took over completely. It stayed at number one for 10 weeks straight and made Ashanti the second artist in history to have their first three tracks on the Billboard charts at the same time. Everyone was ready for her album, and when it dropped in 2002, she debuted at number one and sold over 6 million units. Murder Inc. was getting bigger and bigger, and Ashanti gave him even more clout in the industry when she won a Grammy later that year. Gotti also released a Murder Inc. compilation record the same year to show off all the artists the label had on its roster. The album went gold and had fans wanting more material from the other artists on Murder Inc. because at that point, Ja Rule and Ashanti were the only ones with solo records. 
A lot of people thought Murder, Inc. was just going to keep going up from there, but 2002 was the last year they had before getting wrapped up in some crazy issues with the police. In November of that year, Gotti dropped a remix album, and Jao racked up another 237k sales in the first week with his fourth album, The Last Temptation. Ever since the beginning of Murder, Inc., Gotti was putting on an image like he was some kind of mob boss. He called his artists murderers and even named his studio The Crack House. There are a lot of people in the rap game who front like they're still in the streets, but the cops thought Gotti was actually tied to one of the most brutal drug dealers in the city. Cannon Supreme McGriff came up in the crack era of the 80s and created one of the most powerful gangs in New York called the Supreme Team. He had hundreds of dudes moving weight for him, and in 89, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Supreme was released early in 94, and that's when he linked up with Gotti and his brother Chris while they were filming a music video in Queens. After serving his time, Supreme wanted to get into the movie business and asked him to help him make a movie. They bankrolled his movie Crime Partners, but the cops thought there was way more going on behind the scenes. In 2003, the rap game was shocked when the news broke that the feds raided the murder ring offices and grabbed a bunch of computers and documents to find evidence of money laundering. They thought Supreme gave him drug money to start Murder Inc., and that the label had been washing his dirty money ever since. At the same time they were dealing with money and legal issues, Murder Inc.'s biggest artist was getting absolutely destroyed by his ops in the industry, and when his career went downhill, he took the whole label with him. Ja Rule and 50 Cent both came up in Queens, but instead of linking up and putting on for the hood together, they sparked a wild beef that basically ended Ja's career. It didn't start with John 50 though. Supreme is the one who had static with 50 first, and that's why the Murder Inc. crew got involved. Before he blew up, 50 dropped a track called Ghetto Quran and talked about a bunch of the main street dudes in Queens, including Supreme and his nephew Prince. Supreme was trying to keep a clean image after he got out of prison, but 50 let everyone know what he was like when he rapped. Yo, when you hear talk of the South Side, you hear talk of the team. See, niggas feared Prince and respected Prime. For all you slow motherfuckers, I'ma break it down illa. See, Prime was a businessman and Prince was the killer. Remember, he used to push the bulletproof BM. Ja probably would have sent shots at 50 anyways, but the real drama between them started in 99 while Ja was shooting the music video. According to 50 and some other sources, Ja had his chain snatched by a dude that 50 knew, and when he spotted them chilling together later on, he thought 50 was involved with the robbery. Then 50 dropped the track Lights on the Line and clowned Ja and the rest of Murder Inc. They were all known for screaming it's murder on their tracks, so 50 sent a shot on the hook and raps, scream murder, I don't believe you. Murder, fuck around and leave you. Murder, I don't believe you. Murder, murder, your life's on the line. He didn't call Jao by name, but everyone knew the last verse was aimed at him too when 50 said, now here's a list of MCs that could kill you in eight bars. 50, um, Jay-Z and Nas. I'ma say this shit now and never again. We ain't buddies, we ain't partners, and we damn sure ain't friends. The games you playing, you get killed like that. Acting like you all hard, you ain't built like that. See me when you see me, nigga what? John 50 ended up getting into a fight in Atlanta after a club booked them both for the same night. According to rumors, Ja got his chain snatched and had to get 50 a watch just to get it back, but nobody really knows the details about what went down that night. Then Ja and the Murder Inc. crew found 50 in the studio and Ja's homie Blackchild ended up stabbing him. It was already clear that this wasn't some petty rap beat, and what happened next is what helped turn 50 into a living legend. Supreme McGriff allegedly sent a dude named Hamo to kill 50, and that's when he got shot nine times outside of his grandma's home and almost died. He came out of recovery still swinging that jaw though and aired him out again with the track Wangsta. Ja responded by accusing 50 Cent of getting a protection order from the police, but it turned out that the cops were the one who made the order and 50 didn't have anything to do with it. Ja had been one of the biggest rappers in New York for years, but when 50 Cent dropped his debut album, he was already on another level. Everyone in the game was paying attention to him, and they all heard him diss Ja and Irv Gotti on the track Back Down when he rapped. Yo mammy, yo pappy, that bitch you chasing, your little dirty ass kids, I'll fucking erase them. Your success is not enough, you wanna be hard, knowing if you get knocked, you get fucked in the yard. And maybe I'm so disrespectful, cause to me you're a mystery. I know niggas from your hood, you have no history. Never poke nothing, never pop nothing, nigga stop fronting. And I eat you for breakfast, the watch was in exchange for your necklace. And your boss is a bitch, if he could, he would. Sell his soul for cheap, trade his life to be sure. You can buy cars, but can't buy respect in the hood. Gotti had been trying to develop other artists on Murder Inc. for years, but almost none of them had a buzz in the industry. So 50 aired him out for it and said, It's been years and you had the same niggas in the background. You're never gonna sell Mitsubishi Ta or Crack Child. Them niggas just suck, they no good. I ain't never heard a nigga say they like them in the hood. Ja clapped back with a pretty savage diss record called Loose Chain, but it turned out to be a huge mistake. He didn't just diss 50 Cent, Ja also dissed Eminem and brought up his daughter. 
Nats on 50, M, Buster Rhymes, and D12 all brutally air Jao and pretty much turn him into a joke. Jao going down so hard like that made all of Murder Inc. look bad, and Ashanti ended up getting dragged into all the drama too. Plus, the label was losing millions trying to fight the Fed case, and in 2004, they didn't even have enough cash to film a music video for her new album. Irv and his brother were eventually found not guilty in the money laundering case, but by that time, Murder Inc. was basically dead anyways. Def Jam had dropped them because of all the legal issues, and John and Ashanti's careers never hit the same highs as before. Gotti rebranded the company and started calling it the Inc. so they could fix their image, but it was too late by that point. Gotti signed all kinds of artists to the label, but none of them ever popped off enough to help take Murder Inc. to the next level. The only people who dropped albums on the label were Lloyd and Vanessa Carlton, and they still didn't move enough albums to keep the doors open. Lloyd, Ashanti, and Ja Rule all officially left in 2009. Without anyone left making records, Murder Inc. was dead and gone. Gotti tries to relaunch it in 2013 under his new label Visionary and dropped a new Ja Rule track, but the new version of the label ended up going nowhere. It's clear that Gotti never got over what 50 did to Ja and the rest of Murder Inc. Fat Joe was on Ja's side and beef with 50 for almost a decade before they squashed it, and he tried to make peace with 50 and Ja. Gotti and Ja definitely weren't rocking with the idea though after everything that had happened, and Gotti told DJ Vlad that they're never gonna be cool with him no matter what. A couple years ago, Ja Rule and Fat Joe had a versus battle, and Gotti hopped in the comments during the live stream and said, all y'all talking that 50 shit all good. He got beat up, stabbed up, shot up, and sued us. That's all I'm gonna say. That's what 50 clapped back on Instagram and said, I put the whole label out of business. Fuck with me if you want to. I would stay out of my way if I wasn't me. The beef with 50 wasn't the only thing that hurt Murder Inc's rep, but he really did take down their biggest artist while they were going broke with the legal battle. By the time the beef with 50 cooled off and the money laundering case was over, Murder Inc couldn't recover and ended up falling apart completely. Gotti came into the game ready to take over, and for a few years, it looked like he was really gonna do it. The DMX deal, Jaws' early success, and Ashanti becoming a star made him look like an industry genius, but he couldn't keep the momentum up, and now Murder Inc. is probably gone for good.